Blog Talk Radio. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, recorded live on blogtalkradio.com on March 10, 2008. everyone remembers where they were when they first heard about the planes flying into the World Trade Centers and the Pentagon. For our generation, it's that horrifying moment that matches up with when other generations learned of the Kennedy assassination or the bombing of Pearl Harbor. But where were you when the horror of the Bush administration's handling of 9-11 began settling in? It's an inability to scramble jets that fateful day, or the president staying in an elementary school reading to children about a goat rather than getting up and showing some leadership capabilities. Where were you when the administration resisted a proper investigation of the attack on America? Philip Sheenan, an accomplished and longtime reporter for the New York Times, has written a book that every American should read. The Commission, the Uncensored History of the 9-11 Investigation, is, of all things, a beautifully written journey into the not-so-bipartisan investigation into the government's handling of 9-11 and its aftermath. It's the first book of the 21st century that could be a proper companion to Woodward and Bernstein's classic, All the President's Men. You should read the commission, and then you should get very, very mad. Phil, welcome to Mr. Media. Hey, Bob, how are you? Thanks for having me. Good, thanks for being here today. Um, I know we're gonna have uh, a lot of people listening to this conversation. I will do my best to hold up my end. I am not worried about you holding up your end. (laughs) I appreciate that. Would you, uh, let's start here. Would you disagree with my assessment that this book should make most Americans pretty damn angry? I think it should make an awful lot of people angry, if only because I think the one thing the book does demonstrate is that there were a lot of clues to what was about to happen in September uh, 2001, and clues that just weren't acted on because of just sheer blistering laziness and incompetence. It's it's amazing, you know. We've heard we 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 heard the stories. It's been a couple of years now about uh, that there were documents delivered uh, to Condoleezza Rice to the president that an attack was imminent, that the FBI knew about it. But you know, when you start reading it and you see it in a book like this, which I mean, I, I wasn't kidding. It really is beautifully written. It's a and and you can read it, you know, with the same. It's almost like reading fiction. It's so it's so beautiful because you just can't believe the incompetence that you know is going on ahead of us here. I certainly think people, you know, certainly people in the administration wanted us to believe that there were, you know, they they couldn't connect the dots. There were not enough dots. The dots weren't clear enough. But I think the the fact is that if you just look over the the basic documentary record, there was a lot of evidence, a lot of intelligence to suggest that something like 9/11 was about to happen. And people within the government were raising the alarm, but the people who could act on that information just didn't seem to be terribly interested in it. Well, that's the thing that's always puzzled me about this is I try to think, what's the motivation? You know, uh, we're not in Hollywood, but what's the motivation for all the people who did not act on this information? What, what, What were they thinking? Well, you know, people, a lot of the people we're talking about here are people who work in giant bureaucracies, and a good example of that is the FBI. And people forget, you know, we're talking about July and August of 2001. And I can tell you that in July and August of 2001, uh, the government was just not, it was operating on its summer schedule. People were thinking about their holiday weekends and their vacations and their barbecues and, and this information that was flooding into Washington. For a lot of people, it just seemed easier to deal with it tomorrow. Uh, I, I have to say, Phil, this is your uh, first book, so you may not have discovered this yet, but the book, the book industry operates on the same schedule. They, uh, they only work till uh, one o'clock on Fridays. They, they head out early. Uh, I'm afraid if, if, uh, if uh, uh, a 9/11 hit the book industry in July and August, we wouldn't know about it until September, October. Well, I hate to break it to you, but the newspaper industry operates in the same <laughs> fashion. <laughs> you know, we tease the Europeans for their long summer vacations, but I think we're right there with them. Um, 
now that the book is done, and maybe I'm sort of jumping ahead here a little bit, it's in your rearview mirror, though. And what still leaves you unsettled about the commission, the 9-11 commission? You know, the thing I covered the commission for the two years, and it was it was in existence. And I'm a little disquieted to learn how much I didn't know as it was uh, as it was doing carrying out the investigation. These are things I've learned mostly afterwards. But it's remarkable to me how much they missed. You know, they they largely missed uh, researching the most important government library on terrorism, which is the one maintained by the the eavesdropping agency, the National Security Agency. It just appears the commission mostly didn't pay attention to what was in its files, even though what was in its files was obviously very, very important. Um, it's also It was also amazing to me to discover how many battles were really fought, battles between the commission and the Bush administration and, and within the commission itself. I, I didn't know about a lot of that uh, until I got to work on the book. Um, journalists have taken a very, uh, very strong hit in the years since 9-11 for not pressing the Bush administration, for uh, you know, being in some way subjugated uh, by the administration, uh, being lapdog to the administration. This is nothing you haven't heard before. As you look back, were there mistakes made? Have, you know, did journalists, because this was such a national emergency, did, and I say we, because I, I, you know, I don't cover D.C., but I, I'm, I am a journalist. I mean, you know, did we give them too much of a free pass in the, in the, in the period past 9-11? Well, I'll tell you, you know, it, as you look back at the spring and summer of 2001, what was the big story on the national radar screen out of Washington? Well, it had nothing to do with terrorism, and it had nothing to do with politics. It all really centered on the, the Gary Condit scandal. Do you remember that with the, oh, the sure. intern who disappeared? That was the big story in Washington that summer. Now, apparently, if we journalists had done a little more digging, uh, the people who covered the intelligence community and the law enforcement community, we would have found out that actually the government was on – on, uh, you know, or at least portions of the government were on red alert that something terrible was about to happen and, and that many people in the government were expecting it. One of the things you talk about uh, is uh, you said the, the FBI knew that this was imminent and the FBI kind of fumbled this, but the FAA wasn't even, wasn't even consulting, was it the, let's see, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Authority, was not even aware or relying on, was it the FBI's list of terrorists? They only had like oh, a handful of people? Yeah, no, I mean, this is just a, a, an explanation of just the sheer, again, incompetence, I think is the best word. But uh, the FAA in the sp summer of 2001 had a watch list of, of potential terrorists, you know, the names of people who should not be allowed to board American passenger planes. And uh, it apparently had something like 20 names on it. And the people at the FAA weren't aware that actually another government agency was also compiling a list of possible terrorists, uh, the State Department, which had a, it was known as the tip-off watch list, and it, was, uh, it had something like 60,000 names on it. And the FAA didn't even know that this list existed. So the FAA was operating on the basis of 20 potential terrorists who keep, should keep off planes, when in fact there was another list of 60,000, and two of the names on that list were, were names of men who would be among the 9-11 hijackers. Hmm. I'm thinking Republican response to this would be that, uh, well, it's just instead of saying there's a lot of incompetence going on, they would say, well, it just shows you that the government is too big and we need to cut back further. I'm, I'm not sure it shows that. I'm not sure. It shows that. <laughs> um, so I want to give out the uh, phone number. I don't want to hog you for myself, and I know we have a caller waiting. Uh, folks, if you'd like to call in and ask uh, Phil Sheenan, author of The Commission, uh, the Uncensored History of the 9-11 Investigation. We'd love to have your questions. The number to call if you're listening to us live today on March 10th, 646-595, excuse me, 3135. And let's let's go and see. We've got a caller right here, Phil. Um, hi, do you have a question for Phil Sheenan? Hello? <laughs> Oops. Oops. All right. Uh, well, we have another. Hold on. Okay. Uh, hi, do you have a, a question for Phil Sheenan? Yeah, Bob? Yeah. Yeah, this is Larry. Hey, Larry. Uh, Larry in Minnesota. Larry in Minnesota. Larry, go ahead. What do you, what do you want to ask? Yeah. Um, you know, about, about 10 days ago, I, I did not know that there was any debate regarding the official 9-11 story. I'm, I'm guessing I'm like a lot of Americans who uh, shortly after 9-11 – just ignored it, and uh, possibly because it was too traumatic. And um, but one night I was wasting some time on YouTube and 
decided to look for some video footage from 9-11, and I stumbled upon uh, you know, analysis um, from engineers, architects, academics uh, regarding the collapse of, of uh, Trade Center 1, 2, and 7. And 7, I, I had forgotten even it happened. Um, and you know, based on the science that I was seeing there, and it's, 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 this is really detailed stuff, and it goes on and on and on, um, the science, the, uh, you know, the free fall speed of the collapses, uh, temperature levels, uh, the molten metal, um, and, and the voluminous eyewitness accounts of, of explosions, um, it, it certainly seems to me that, that, uh, that uh, a commission would need to investigate, you know, what, was, what really happened there. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, Phil, how did the 9-11 Commission deal with the issue of the collapse of the WTC buildings and what was happening behind the scenes with the commission and its staff regarding this issue? Well, this, I mean, we should specify the World Trade Center 1 and 2 were the Twin Towers, and World Trade Center 7 is a building nearby that, that came down the same day. And there are a lot of conspiracy, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories uh, that center on the idea that, that, that 9-11 was really an inside job, that, that uh, the Bush administration or people affiliated with the administration wanted um, the terrorist attacks to be carried out for a, a variety of reasons and that the World Trade Center buildings were brought down not by the impact from the planes, uh, but by some sort of pre-planted explosives there. Now, the 9-11 the Commission uh, did have some scientists and engineers associated with it who investigated these issues uh, to some degree. Um, they, I think, relied to a large extent on the work of, of others within the government who investigated. There's a, an agency called NIST, and I can't tell you what that acronym stands for at the moment, but it is the sort of the, the official architectural scientific agency that, that looks into these matters. And it is just about to produce a report, as I understand it, on what happened to World Trade Center 7, which is this building nearby that came down the same day. As I understand it from the 9-11 Commission staff, they, they think that, you know, that, that it, it, it's very clear to them, they say, that, that the Twin Towers came down largely from the impact of the planes. World Trade Center 7 has come down. I've seen one theory offered because there were big diesel fuel tanks in the basement, uh, diesel fuel tanks that have been placed there, ironically enough, uh, to provide power for an emergency command post that was put in the building for Rudy Giuliani, the, the former mayor. Uh, but I'm going to say, I'm going to fess up and say that I, I am not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, and I can only tell you what the investigators on the on the commission had to say about this. Yeah, it is it is interesting. I um, I'm a, a freelance writer and, and have worked in journalism, and um, gosh, if if I was you know in a position right now to to cover what what is out there uh, in the scientific community, architects architects engineers regarding the skepticism of the of the account and and really strongly held opinions that that was a controlled demolition I, I i would be all over this story i think it's absolutely incredible i mean for that w one problem i have with the controlled demolition argument or, or among the problems i have is the fact that it is amazing to me that if if that were really the case that not a word of it has leaked in all these years you know it's very hard to keep a secret oh yeah i mean i i i don't i don't know where this leads i mean i don't know how you explain how it was done but when you, just looking at the, you know, the the the, the facts, um, and 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 considering the, the laws of physics, you know, for that WTC seven to to fall at at free fall speed, basically the same speed that if you dropped a marble from the top of it, that's how fast it fell down. That, that's that's astounding. It's it's absolutely astounding. I, I guess again, I'm I, I'm I'm no technical expert. I, I would be. I I think we might want to all hold our breath for a minute and see what the this uh, federal agency has to say because apparently it is a within the architectural uh, engineering community it is quite well respected in its judgments right okay Hello. well that's what I had Bob okay Larry thank you very much for calling okay. I appreciate it thanks thanks Bye. all right so, so uh, along that line uh, the books uh, the book's been out about a month now is it is it too soon for you to be hearing from uh, the legion of conspiracy theorists out there about 9/11, or has that already begun for you? Oh well, no, that began on almost the first day, uh, <laughs> and the book has been harshly criticized by those people. They say, you know, there are people. There's a, a large community of people in this country and around the world who believe that this must have been part of a, a larger conspiracy uh, in which, you know, perhaps elements of the Bush administration cooperated with Al Qaeda on, in these attacks. Um, 
it's it's uh, if true, it's 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 uh, uh, an amazing thing. I, I say I just don't have the evidence in front of me to, to demonstrate it. Yeah, it's funny. I, I used to think uh, that the president was just uh, kind of a simpleton and being controlled by people around him. And while that hasn't necessarily changed in all these years, I just there's just something about this whole thing. It, I just feel like there's a big answer that's hanging out there that we don't have yet, and that as long as the Bush administration is in power, we're not going to have that answer. Uh, that, no, I, I, I see your point. And, you know, I, I think my book, I, I've actually told some of the conspiracy theorists, well, listen, I'm not proving what you say is true. I do think, you know, you, I'm, I'm surprised some of them don't make use of the book as an argument for a new investigation for a variety of reasons. Mm. Um, let's, uh, I'm going to go back. There was a caller we tried before. I'm going to see if they're on here. I'll give them one more ch- chance. Uh, I think this is someone up in the Virginia area. Did you have a question for Phil Sheenan? Hello. Okay, we'll let that one go. If they want, they can call back. Um, what's the strangest thing you've been asked about or challenged on? Mm, I mean, a lot of them have to do with these questions about uh, whether or not there is a, a larger conspiracy at work here. Um, I, I do get asked a lot about. Um, I don't know. It's not. It's not weird. It's. 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 It's interesting though about about Philip Zelico, who is the guy who really ran the investigation in many ways. He's a, a historian at the University of Virginia who was the executive director of the 9-11 Commission. And, and as much as anybody really ran the day-to-day investigation and as much as anybody else really wrote and edited the final report. And I, I get a lot of questions about all of his ties to the White House and his very close friendship with Condoleezza Rice and whether or not that had any impact on on the way the report was presented to the world. Mm. And ultimately, do you think that it did? I think it almost had to, if only because, you know, this, uh, you know, he had very strong opinions that he made clear to the people who worked for him. And he was very much the funnel through which all information had to pass uh, between the staff and the commission and and vice versa. And uh, I, I do think that those of us in the world who've been edited at one point or another know that how our editor feels about a subject uh, makes a big difference in the way our, our work is presented to the world. Mm. That uh, reporter's bias that we're not supposed to show, it, it comes through in different ways. And there's, and there's editor's bias as well. Mm-hmm. You have a, a, a line here that I like that I think was kind of telling early on. You say, it is a polite, and this relates to Zelico, you say that the polite fiction in Washington that the reports of Blue Ribbon Federal Commissions are written by the commissioners themselves, that in truth, most of the reports are written by a professional staff led by a full-time staff director. And, of course, in the case of the 9-11 Commission, that was Zelico. What I was wondering as I, as I was reading is, now that the book's been out, uh, the commission was headed by uh, former New Jersey Governor Tom Keene and also uh, Lee Hamilton, who I, I, I'm thinking was a representative. Exactly. Yeah, right? And uh, have you heard from them uh, in terms of you know, their thoughts on, on the book? I, I haven't heard from them personally. They they joined in a statement uh, with nine, nine of the commissioners uh, joined in a statement saying that uh, essentially saying that the book was too tough on Philip Zelico and that they that uh, they the, the report should be judged on its own, not to, not to, by Philip Zelico's ties to the to the Bush administration. Interesting. I, I, I was not aware of that statement. I'm, I'm kind of surprised. And, in light of what I've read in the book, that they would, uh, that they would jump to that defense. Well, they, you know, they, they feel that uh, I, I think some of the 9/11 commissioners feel that anything that tarnishes the commission somehow tarnishes their own uh, personal legacy, and so therefore, uh, if if the book is critical of the commission, they feel sort of individually criticized here. Mm. Um, that's probably to be expected. So I think we have another call here. Let's go. Uh, let's go to the phones. Hi, do you have a question for Phil Sheenan? Hello. Hi, do you have a question? Uh, uh, I just uh, tuned in, so I just wanted to know if you guys could bring me up to speed about what's going on here. What are you talking about? Uh, yeah, we're, to- we're talking about Phil Sheenan's book, The Commission, The Uncensored History of the 9-11 Investigation. Oh, and I'm if, Canadian. Uh, all right. Well, thanks for calling. Um, yeah, that was a big uh, farce. Do you think it was well, set up? Let's ask you. Do you think it was set up? Yeah. What was set up about it? Well, uh, wasn't Bush in bed with the Bin Laden family? As, uh, you know. 
uh, you know, that's certainly an argument made that the the 9/11 Commission report uh, went very soft, uh, not so much on the Bin Laden family as on the the Saudi government, um, and the Saudi government is very tied into the Bin Laden family. Osama bin Laden's father is one of the was one of the big industrialists of Saudi Arabia, ran a huge engineering company that's still in existence to this day. Right. Wasn't Bush involved with them, though, the Bush family? I've certainly heard that argument. I, I don't know that they were I, – I, certainly the two families had a lot of similar interests um, yeah. in the oil bin, it, business and elsewhere. I, I think they were in bed together. Okay. You well, know what I mean? Uh, yeah, no, they said they, they, there was a big flap after 9-11 with the discovery that the federal government had allowed a lot – you know, the bin Laden family is a huge family. Uh, Osama has a lot of brothers and sisters, and yeah. the Bush, Bush White House allowed plane loads of Bin Laden family members to to leave the country to evacuate the United States shortly after 9/11. Jeez, I wonder why. Well, and there were a lot of concerns that the, that this was sort of an inside. This was a. It fix. was a total inside job, man. Yeah. I but, think, anyways, like you know, uh, if 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 you owed me a lot of money, I would be driving a plane into your house too. Uh, you right. know what I mean, like. Well, Listen, gee, I, gee, I hope not. But <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> like hypothetically, yeah, okay. I'd be upset. I'd be upset. Okay. All right. You know. Well, I, I, we appreciate the call. I'm, I'm gonna, uh, Philip. I'm gonna ask you a little about that uh, myself. Uh, the uh, uh, just waiting for this. Uh, uh, the, the Saudis. I mean, most Americans, I think, had thought of until 9/11 that the Saudis were our friends, our business partners. It was a, a country uh, as a whole that kind of looked out for us at certain times during the world crisis that we had this good relationship with. And then suddenly 9-11 happens. Um, bin Laden is revealed to most of the American public for the first time as, as a Saudi. And um, first of all, we, we, you know, we're, we're suddenly left with questions we've never had before about the Saudi government, the, the royal family and their intentions to us, things that really have never been answered to this day, have they? No, and I, you know, I think we're kidding ourselves if we think we've always had the, the wholehearted support of, of the Saudi people. Um, you know, Osama bin Laden was a very, remains in big port, corners of Saudi Arabia to be a, a hero. He was certainly a big hero in Saudi Arabia before 9-11. Um, and uh, after 9-11, uh, there was an awful lot of evidence uh, revealed that suggested that there were some elements of the Saudi government that had actually provided, you know, logistical support for al-Qaeda and, and, you know, even more uh, intriguingly may have provided important logistical supports for some of the hijackers when they lived in the U.S. before 9-11. Uh, two of the hijackers lived very much in the open in San Diego for about a year and a half before 9-11. And a group of uh, young Arab expatriate men living in Southern California stepped forward to help them out. And it, it appeared pretty clearly that some of these men were on the payroll in one way or another of the Saudi government. And some of the investigators on the 9-11 Commission staff uh, felt very strongly that all of that should be pointed out in the, in the final report of the 9-11 Commission. But for uh, reasons involving the leadership of the commission, most of that material never got into the final report of the uh, of the 9/11 Commission, though, though you'll find it in my book. Yeah, you know, we talk about the things that give us pause with regard to you know to full trust and and respect in in government, and you know, it's things like that where someone is clearly protecting someone. And it's just hard to imagine that the, the that uh, whoever is being protected is more important than the the American people's right to know what happened on that day. And, you know, if, if there's nothing sinister about it, then why shouldn't we be hearing the details? It's, it's I agree. In, in that case involving the Saudis, the material didn't go into the final report of the 9-11 of the, uh, Commission because uh, the guy who was leading that particular team of investigators on the commission was a very well-respected but very, very conservative prosecutor who felt that unless you had 100 percent proof of something, you shouldn't make the allegation. Well, when you're talking about a shadowy organization like al-Qaeda and a, a very authoritarian regime like Saudi Arabia's, you're never going to have 100% proof uh, of, of almost anything. Uh, and uh, the, his, his, his investigators believe very strongly the commission was making a big mistake by not going forward, make, not making public uh, the best information it had. Hmm. 
Let me uh, give out our phone number again. Uh, we've had some interesting calls. Uh, if you'd like to call in and you're listening live today on March 10th, 2008, uh, call in with a question for Phil Sheenan at 646-595-3135. Um, so how did you choose this as the topic for your first book? Uh, you've, you've been with the New York Times a long time. You've, you've, been a, you've, you've recorded from a lot of foreign countries. You've held a lot of uh, big positions at the paper as a, as a correspondent and a reporter. Uh, why, why did this? Why was this the turn on to have you write a book? Well, I, I covered the commission for the better part of two years. That was my beat. And at the end of it, um, I thought there was probably some good detective stories to tell about the work of the commission. Uh, during the uh, investigation of, by the commission, I didn't have access to most of the staff. They were, you know, these are 85 people who were mostly barred from talking to reporters. Uh, after the commission went out of business, so suddenly these people were available to me and and had some you know astonishing stories to tell, and it occurred to me that you know I, I was covering the the equivalent for our generation of the Warren Commission. This was sort of the big government investigation of our lifetimes, and uh, it occurred to me with the Warren Commission if somebody had pretty quickly after it had gone out of business produced some sort of internal history of the commission that might have been a big public service and and probably would have had some important information to reveal. And I, and I thought this was my opportunity. This was, a, I know this turned out to be a great story for me to cover, and there was much more of it to cover that I couldn't, that I couldn't deal with while I uh, was writing for the daily newspaper. It, it seemed to have the workings of a book. It's, that's the thing. I mean, it, and that's what I love about the way you tell it. It is a story. It's not a, it's not a dead recitation of this happened and then that happened. You tell it as a story. And, you, you know, did you... Uh, a book is a big thing to tackle, and this is a humongous topic. Uh, did you think when the commission ended its work and you had finished covering it that, oh, well, you know, I've got all this stuff, uh, I'll do a little more digging and, and throw the book together, and then, you know, the story starts taking you in other places? No, I mean, if, it, if, if, if I hadn't learned much more than I knew, knew at the time I was covering the commission, I don't think I would have done a book. I, I don't think hmm. the world needs any more of those. But I, I did find that I was learning a tremendous amount I didn't know before. And also, it, there was a great human element to this, which is there were some just phenomenal characters to write about in the course of this book. You know, everybody from Henry Kissinger to Philip Zelikow, the, the man who ran the thing, to a lot of the young staffers, really quite brilliant young people who did the digging and had these great detective stories to tell, that, stories that I couldn't tell at the time I was covering the commission. So as I said, I think people who go into this book will discover there's a lot in here they had no concept of before. Certainly, I had no concept of it until I uh, did the reporting for the book. Now, how many people did you interview for the book? Uh, I talked to about two-thirds of the, the 85 people on the staff. I spoke to eight of the 10 commissioners uh, for the book, uh, and I spoke to probably you know hundreds of other people uh, involved one way or another with the 9-11 commission. Which commissioners did you not talk to? Uh, two of the Republicans, uh, Jim Thompson, uh, the former governor of Illinois, who was very helpful to me in truth during the course of the investigation. He just didn't choose to talk to me for the book. Uh, and uh, Fred Fielding, who is now the, the, the counsel at the White House. Ah, okay. I guess we can see. And Thompson had some, some, some other ethical problems, didn't he? Well, Thompson, Thompson is one of the commissioners who is really uh, least involved in the day-to-day -day workings of the commission. And that almost certainly has something to do with the fact that he was very – tied up in this morass of a criminal investigation in Chicago, his home, uh, mm -hmm. over, the, uh, the, over Conrad Black, the, the media mogul who just went to – I guess has only just gone to jail for uh, stealing you know, millions of dollars from his publishing empire. And Fred Fielding has ties back to the Nixon administration, doesn't he? Well, I mean, Fred Fielding is sort of an institution in Washington. He was, uh, he was a deputy uh, White House counsel during Watergate for President Nixon. He was then the – White House counsel for President Reagan, and he's recently taken that job up again for, for President Bush. So usually where Fielding shows up, something smells bad. Well, yeah, or, you know, but it, I would, I, 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 he would argue that he just shows up when uh, you know, a powerful <laughs> client needs a powerful lawyer. Yeah, interesting. Um, uh, now, Kissinger did not talk to you, is that right? He did not, no. no. Uh, and probably not a surprise there either. Well, no, and, and the portrayal of the I, – I, I imagine he's not very comfortable with his portrayal in the book. But it's, one of, it's actually one of my favorite anecdotes in the book, though, which is that a group of the – Henry Kissinger is initially named to run the 9-11 Commission. 
Uh, he only lasts in that job about a month before he resigns. And he, he resigns, I now know, because a day before his resignation, he was confronted by a lot of the 9-11 families in his offices, the offices of his consulting for, uh, firm in New York. And the families um, apparently got him so rattled that he nearly fell off the couch and, and spilled his coffee. <laughs> That was a great. That was the. Uh, that's that's right at the beginning of the book, and it's it's one of those uh, retellings where, where people will know that this is not uh, is this is not the typical uh, look at history that that's going to make you weep and fall asleep uh, <laughs> with, within minutes. I mean, it's a great retelling. I, I'm assuming that uh, uh, some of the the uh, Jersey girls uh, were the sources for that information. Oh no no they were and they they tell that story and they tell it with you know as you can imagine with great delight. And, you know, it's further proof of really the, how the Jer Jersey girls, which are a group of widows from New Jersey, right. um, and uh, the, the families really made such an important difference. And, I mean, they really got the, cr the commission created in the first place, and, and they, better than anybody else, really policed the commission as it went forward. Now, these women have been uh, – they've, they've been through the ringer in these years. Obviously, they lost their families. They've had to, they've had to become uh, political. They've had to, you know – Lobby and do all kinds of things. They were attacked by, uh, um, and I think it was Ann Coulter. Exactly. Right. And uh, and you know it's been a tough time for them. I, I feel I feel for them even more. I, I, I think a number of them are from East Brunswick, New Jersey. I'm from actually from North Brunswick, New Jersey. So I felt a little kinship there when they were being attacked. Uh, have you heard from them since the book has come out? Sure. No. And I think they're you know they're very pleased that a lot of these stories have been uh, have been told. Um, they were really uh, among the people who were most uh, uh, aggressive about trying to monitor what what Philip Zelico was doing or not doing on the commission. They called very early on for his resignation, in fact. Hmm. Uh, with the publication of this book, yeah. well, let me go back. Um, the, the interviews that you did for the book, uh,